within um, local city, villages, and municipalities on how to share uh, attacks that relate to cyber and stuff like that. You know, you got to think about critical infrastructure. You know, what if a critical infrastructure gets taken down? Okay, how do we share that information? And then how do we respond accordingly um, to that? <clears throat> now, in this particular part of the presentation, we're going to focus on some other events. And most recently, we're going to focus on my country, United States of America. And we're going to talk about three different things. We're going to talk about fake news domestic terrorists and insurgency, and then how these items really can tie into your particular country as well, or any country um, that is dealing with these particular types of issues. So if you've been watching the news, you probably uh, noticed that some of the biggest things that went, went on in my country, um, you had issues regarding uh, fake news. We had domestic terrorists. We've had for a number of years a way of reclassifying individuals as domestic terrorists and also the insurgency on the actual capital. And so we'll talk about that and then we'll go a little bit more deeper as well. So active measures is something interesting. <clears throat> so in this particular uh, item that was published, foreign state sponsored disinformation in, in the digital age, this is really this is really interesting. So active measures is something that Russia has done since the 1920s. And, and so when you think about a white lie, right? So it's like, it's a half truth. So what active measures does, it takes these half truths and it uses this to create this organization, right? So let's think about one of the biggest things that happened here in terms of disinformation that was actually started by Russia. AIDS was created by the white man, right? That was, that was one of the things, a way to get rid of individuals. Now, when you actually look at how it was spread, it was spread through an Indian researcher that published an article. It went, it went through one African country, went throughout, and then later, 10 years later, about approximately 10 years later, it was presented um, by a newscaster on the East Coast, and it shows you how this information is able to spread and how it's unchecked. It can cause lots of harm, right? So when you look at the slide, it says it's offensive. It includes offensive programs such as disinformation, propaganda, deception, sabotage, destabilization, and espionage. Right? So you get this information, you're like, okay, well, what do I do with it? What does this information uh, tell me to do? Right? It may say something about a particular political opponent or a particular group or a tribe. And you see the information and then people act on the information. Right now, a lot of people use social media. They take social media as gospel. They see the item on social media and they say, all right, well, this must be true. Um, there's a million likes. Everyone in my friend network is sharing this. Perhaps it's true. In the United States, the big issue is that a lot of people um, do not trust, I guess, what they say as uh, traditional media, right? They say, well, it's, it's controlled. Um, I need another outlet. And so what happens is you have these particular pages that are used to um, give or provide this information, right? They'll say, well, this particular uh, politician is doing X, Y, and Z. They're, they're kidnapping babies. And so people will see that and say, oh, well, I need to stop it. Or if there's a particular movement, it will happen through this page in terms of getting people organized against another group, right? So now you're doing destabilization because these individuals arts, reading information that's telling them to do something or to direct them to particular actions. And with these actions, they're destabilizing parts of that society, right? So with active measures, one doesn't even have to go into a particular country, especially in the digital age. You can just go on Facebook, you can use WhatsApp, or you can find out what platform a particular country or group use most and inject yourself in there. Now, what's, what's also interesting, when you look more at these slides, you'll see that this slide talks about insurgency. And so here it says that, and this was done by the Center for American Progress, that the United States could be in the early days of a domestic insurgency. <clears throat> when you look at the election results of last year, really got to look at them, right? When we talked about fake news and stuff like that, 
look at the election results and you'll see that Joe Biden had 290 electoral college votes and Donald Trump had 214. But if you look at this particular slide, you'll see, and this is from, this is post, um, posted by Deutsche Welle, so a uh, German news site. You'll see that in the middle, it's all red, right? And you'll see in the, in the uh, east and the west is all blue. What this means for someone who's doing active measures or they're using the internet um, and social media platforms to create uh, a divide, um, you can see that there's already a divide that exists between the coast, uh, the, the Midwest, but if you look in middle of America, you see that it's all red. Just because there, you know, Joe Biden has won, now President Biden, that that these people still exist and their thoughts haven't changed. It's only been a few months, if that. Um, that there's tons of um, habit that can be caused through the internet and through digital platforms. And so it's really important. So when you when you look about what happened with um, the recent domestic insurgency, this was planned via a social media site. It was actually a tool to coordinate individuals in terms of how are they going to storm the Capitol. So this is, this is another thing, well-planned insurgency, right? So at first, the government thought that, okay, a uh, news media thought, okay, maybe perhaps this was something that was just out of nowhere. But if you start looking at other posts and start doing, looking at coordinating uh, how things were coordinated, you'll see the individuals post on Twitter, hey, we're going to take back uh, the White House, we're going to stop this, and all those other, you know, related items or tasks, per se, actions. Um, you can see that this was fairly well coordinated, uh, and especially if you look months prior to what occurred from the former president, you can see that via, you know, online that this stuff is pretty coordinated, and plus, when you look at other countries and how they reacted or their so-called participation, you can see that this was really on a massive scale um, and it creates, you know, destabilization. Now, when you look at the insurgency, <clears throat> you also have to look at other groups, right? So after nine, during 9-11, America thought, And 9-11, other particular terrorist acts are going to come from outside the country, and they failed to look within. And that's really because of how they classify terrorism and stuff like that. So when you look at right-wing attacks, and you can see from 1994 to 2020, the percentage of attacks and what has changed in terms of who the actual group is being attacked. So if you look at 2015 to 2020, the largest percentage of attacks were against private individuals, African-Americans, Latinos. The second group was religious uh, institutions, Jewish, Muslim, and so forth. And then the third most type of right-wing attacks is actual government, military, police, right? Eight percent of those attacks were to this particular group. And then 42 percent to the first group and 32 to the second. This particular chart right here, or this slide, it just talks about the lack of domestic terrorism charges. And so you see here, <clears throat> how many individuals, you know, um, have been found guilty, what percentage, what are they actually charged with? Even with the insurgency, um, the actual charges were very light in comparison to what should have actually uh, been given out. But if you remember then Dylan Ruth, who actually wore the um, South African apartheid uh, sticker, and that sticker, flag or whatever on him uh, in his so-called manifesto. Uh, this individual who uh, killed three people, injured 23 others, uh, sorry, killed nine people, sorry, killed nine people at the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal uh, Church in Charleston, but he was not charged with domestic terrorism. And then you look at other individuals, they weren't charged with domestic terrorism as well. They were charged with other things rather than domestic terrorism. <clears throat> now, when you look at, when you think about fake news, you have to think about what are the other things that could occur, right? So you think about misinformation and, and the most important thing that's going on right now globally is this pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic. Right. So here it's important because in, in my country, 
we have individuals that don't wear masks, that do wear masks, that social distance and don't social distance. So you can see the rising numbers of COVID in many places. I'll give a prime example. In the metropolitan area I live in, which is Chicago, individuals, for the most part, uh, try to follow the actual guidelines set forth. The institution that I work at, they say, all right, well, we're going to add in these extra measures to make sure you're safe, that your students are safe, and things of that particular nature. When I took a trip last year, I probably shouldn't have, <laughs> when I took a trip last year to Florida, um, when I was on the western part, Marco Island and in Florida, individuals were not really practicing social distancing. Not everyone had masks. It was like a completely different world. Yet, uh, during that time, Florida was actually surging in COVID cases, right? Because it's all disinformation. So individuals do not check their actual news or they see news presented by a particular outlet that they don't trust and say, all right, well, uh, COVID can be cured by drinking bleach. And we, we see what happened when individuals tried that. Now we're going to go and we're going to talk a bit about a little bit more items that are closer to your home. <clears throat> now, Ethiopia is a powerhouse in East Africa, right? So Kenya is actually known for being the mobile uh, device powerhouse, digital uh, powerhouse, stuff like that. But in terms of politics, it's actually Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. It's uh, been noted as the world's third most politically important city. And that's because of the African Union, which is comprised of 54 countries and some other member states. Also, because of how many embassies are actually within the city. I believe over 100 embassies uh, are within the city. <clears throat> but there's been a number of issues in Addis Ababa, in particular, the African Union. In 2008, sorry, 2018, it was found that the Chinese bugged the African Union headquarters. So this is the equivalent of the European Union having their actual headquarters building built by a country that is not part of the EU. And then their hardware and all their equipment provided by them as well. And then later conducting all of their particular meetings there. Some more likely are classified and things were bugged by the Chinese. So this was published uh, in multiple outlets. I just put Quartz Africa in the Financial Times. And so here you can just see individuals talking about the accusations of Chinese, Chinese uh, hackers uh, in the EU. The problem with this is the, a lot of the infrastructure projects are being funded by Chinese, right? So if you're being funded by a particular group and something negatively, negatively occurs, are you truly going to say, well, yeah, we understand what you did, but we're against it. And, and that is one of the issues. And that brings me to the next slide, where yet again, <laughs> Chinese hackers stole camera footage from the AU. So a memo came out, and this is something I, I took from um, Reuters, and it's basically said that um, suspected Chinese hackers stole camera footage from the African Union. Now, this is important because there was actually a... Uh, uh, individual part of um, the um, AU, um, I guess she was in charge of the AU, and she's South African, and there's actually a planned attack assassination on her, her life. So the camera footage being stolen is actually important because now you know exactly who's coming in and out, the times they leave in and out, who they may be coming with, if they have security and stuff like that. And you can later plan a physical attack based off the actual camera information that was stolen. Now, I'm going to briefly talk about South Africa because South Africa is so close to this country and Botswana is so dependent upon goods from South Africa. You know, uh, there's a lot of goods that are here. There's banking that comes with support from South Africa, stuff like that. But right now, South Africa is, a, is vulnerable and is a key target for espionage, right? <clears throat> and so... The university, um, Botswana International University of Technology in Habaroni, which is the capital, is very close to Pretoria. And Pretoria has been known and identified as the new El Dorado espionage. <clears throat> so there was a leak. There was a South African uh, cable leak. And his leak showed tons of information that was being leaked in terms of 
what they were doing. <clears throat> so if you look here, um, this is from the spy cables. There's a link in here. I'll share it. I'll, I'll have this presentation shared so you can see it later and you can go see the leaks. Um, but you'll see that there were tons of information leaked how a lot of actually the South African intelligence service, a number of the machines were actually not really protected. Individuals were able to log in. Um, there was um, use of weak passwords, lack of encryption, um, documents that were stolen um, by, by other countries, um, stuff that dealt with nuclear technology that South Africa had years ago before they actually relinquished during apartheid. All the information and more was actually stolen. And then here it talks about how South Africa has been used to uh, spy on other countries. So what, what's interesting is that the leaked files contains the names of 78 spies, 78 spies working in Pretoria, right? 78 spies. And this is interesting because this is just the names of that were actually found. Um, names from uh, Senegalese um, intelligence to Mossad to numerous other countries. <clears throat> and when you read this, the cables and you see just how, I guess, it wasn't really covert. <laughs> a lot of the stuff was pretty much in the open. You'd have a taxi driver, he'd drive you um, one week, and the next week he comes back and says, hey, I have a half a million dollars to invest in your company. Let's talk, right? And so with this, South Africa ended up having to deal with this fallout, but this fallout really didn't go away. The fallout technically is still there. Now, I'm going to talk <clears throat> specifically about Botswana and why there needs to be an immediate need to focus on cyber defense. <clears throat> One thing I've noticed being here in a short period is that social media is highly used. Another thing is that this country is relatively safe, very peaceful, and very trustworthy. People are extremely trustworthy, and that causes an issue. So if you look online, you'll see lots of jobs, classifieds, dating, group chat and networking, <clears throat> where people freely share their information. In terms of jobs, people will share their information, they'll share their number, their WhatsApp number, you'll see the name for their actual profile. Uh, and then also, they're willing to even share identification of other things, which opens them up to scams, right? It opens people up to scams in terms of not being able to protect the information that they're sharing much more. And I will jump on that in a little bit. What I want to do now <clears throat> is talk about injection. So there's something called OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, and they have their top 10 uh, most common vulnerabilities. Over the last decade, these haven't changed at all. One of them is injection. So if you go in your web browser, <clears throat> you type in PHP ID equals one dot gov space dot gov dot BW. This will pull up the actual government websites for Botswana. Uh, you can also do PHP question mark ID. Either will work. And this will bring up a number of vulnerable websites or websites that may have a vulnerability. I'm just going to show three. I didn't use any tools against these sites. These are just something I freely did, openly did. I just looked at the results. <laughs> I know we had two ministers talk before me, so I just want to, you know, put that out there. But th the three websites I'm just showing, <clears throat> the uh, Ministry of Finance, the government debt website came up. Uh, the Ministry of Finance website came up. And then also the, uh, the procurement page for the Ministry of Finance came up as well. The scary thing is there's a tool that you can use freely. You can throw it out there. And what it will do is it will run a ton of different attacks against uh, a particular database for SQL. For some particular websites, <clears throat> a number of things will come up. It'll have username and password. It will be hashed, but there's a ton of websites that will do a hash to uh, hash converter, um, and it will convert it to actually, you know, what the password is. But it's just, you know, it's just important that even government websites are <clears throat> making sure that they have appropriate security credentials in place. So things like this do not uh, appear on the web. Because this attack could have happened from anywhere. And say if someone's actually applying to one of these websites, they're applying for a job or something like that, they have their CV up there. The CV will contain that person's you know, name, their email address, all critical information that can be later used to guess their password, right? Where did I go to school at? It's in your CV. 
Uh, what is, uh, you know, my address or the street I grew up in? You may be still living at the same particular home that you grew up in because you don't, you don't have a job yet. So that information is up. So it's really important that websites, especially here, think about OWASP top 10 at a bare minimum and how to protect against that. <clears throat> now, in terms of internet scams, this is interesting. So through Facebook, I, I pulled up a number of particular pages and just looked at um, some key things. So I'm sure everyone here in Botswana is very familiar with the infamous uh, 419 scam out of Nigeria. What's, what's interesting, there is a replica just here in Southern Africa. So I, I, I pretty much blocked everything out. I just kept the picture and then the prefix so you can see where these actual um, items are coming from. The first one, the first 20 person to commit, I will teach him or her how to earn 44,000 pulas. No scam, no scam. When people say that, it's, it's a scam. <laughs> and it starts now, if you enter us, inbox me on WhatsApp. And 267, that is this country's area, this country, this country code. When you look to the right, same time, same day, permanent results with Papa Frank, right? And so now ask for the WhatsApp. Um, there's other items that talk about boosting business, winning court cases, uh, immediate money in your account. And you look at this particular item here, this country code 260 is from Zambia. So what that means is you have items coming in from Botswana, scams from Botswana as well, from Zambia, and there's other scams from other countries. What this does is it takes advantage of that trustworthy, you know, being trustworthy here in the country. And again, this is something that is done not through here. You can be in any anywhere in the world, create a um, get a SIM card, have a number from these countries, and then you can set you can start doing digital crime and stuff like that. So technically, this two six zero number could be from the United States. There was a, there was something interesting in terms of news that it talked about one of the largest uh, Nigeria for one scams was actually from Louisiana and it was actually Caucasian Americans that were doing this. Caucasian Americans doing the scam. So you have to be ever vigilant. And this means you actually have to um, have the uh, regular citizen understand, you know, what is cyber security? What does it mean to them and how to protect themselves? Earlier, I talked about um, the heavy reliance on other countries, in particular, Southern Africa. Now, Southern Africa or SA, as you people call it, locals call it, had one of their largest ever data breaches after Experian, right? So here they had over 24 million exposed accounts. So personal identifiable information, PI, was exposed. Over 24 million, right? That is large. Also, the, the, uh, the bigger issue is that this particular bank not only deals in SA, but it deals in a number of other countries. So if you look here and we look at the actual bank, you'll see that there's offices in South Africa, there's offices in Lesotho, there's offices in Namibia, Uganda, and a number of other countries, including this one, right? So the issue here is that if you're reliant, a heavily reliant upon another country to provide you services and goods, you have no insight into their supply chain. So you don't know if someone else injected some type of malware, um, they're using that to exploit. Like the blue phone, I've seen the blue phone here. The blue phone had a couple hundred thousand dollars, hundred, sorry, a couple hundred thousand mobile devices that were vulnerable to actual hackers. It was actually built in malware. But I've seen that device used here. Of course, I've seen Huawei. And again, that deals with like 5G and stuff like that when you're using these other countries' infrastructures. Uh, the technology infrastructure, which means that you have to start developing these things of your own or actually have insight of what's going on. There was actually an uh, individual talking from the government talking about the issue with not doing manufacturing here, but just being a consumer of products. Uh, one, it doesn't really help your economy because you're just buying product from another country and there's no job creation. But secondly, it's a security issue because you have no clue what is actually uh, built in that product. What is that product made of? Is it actually something that's going to damage or is it something that's going to be hackable or is it something that is going to be vulnerable? So this is really important, understanding the supply chain. In my country, 
uh, within the last three days, President Biden just signed an executive order supply chain. And this was just after the solar winds attack, right? The hack, this solar winds hack that allowed individuals to get inside the federal government. So if these things are happening in other countries, be sure that they will be happening in your country as well if they're not already happening and you're just not aware of it. Now, this last slide is just about a conference that I'm having in Chicago. It's online. Uh, I will be sure to share the information with you. It's called Shy CyberCon, and uh, it's April 16th. It's free. Uh, we'll have speakers from um, the federal government, our, my federal government as well, and we'll have industry leaders in cyber. But if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Um, and then if you'd like to chat later, uh, I'm available. I'm actually here. Um, we can talk as well. So I will stop at this moment. Uh, thank you, Prof, for the presentation. I think I'll, I'll also allow uh, the guests to ask questions. I remember when you're asking a, a question, you are uh, clicking your name on the platform, and then we'll go to uh, an icon just, just, in the, just beside your name. Wait, return set status, and then you can see the options. So you can raise your hand, and the moderators can see you from the other side and give you the platform to ask a question or any comment. So I'm looking in the chat. I don't see any questions yet. All right. Don't be afraid. Just, just a question. There is no right, wrong, or uh, poor question or poorly worded question. All right, with that, I am going to um, be done. So I'd like to thank everyone for uh, attending my particular uh, talk. Thanks a lot, Prof. Uh, Dawson. The next talk will be at 12 o'clock uh, by Spectrum, Mr. Tebuhoe Mohalemang from Spectrum Analytics. So, Prof. Dawson, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. Uh, based on what you you have said, mostly in terms of all the attacks that you have highlighted here, if you were to advise some senior officials or government officials here, what would you say would be the best place to start preparing ourselves? I mean, as a nation, I think you had earlier in the morning that as a nation, we are going through a process of digital transformation as well. So based on that, how would you advise to go about things, to do our digital uh, transformation in a more secure manner. Because part of the transformation will obviously include acquiring of equipment, uh, moving data, starting to store more data and stuff like that. Well, one of the good things is that there is a lot of 
items that have been done already. If you look at like the NIST um, special publications, sorry, the NIST special publications, um, these items are already out there. So there's baseline documents and guidance done that you could actually take, use, and then modify to, to your use. So you could do that. Also, you need to prioritize cybersecurity education. So I, I know here at Disney Lee University, there's cybersecurity education, um, but there is a lack of it among the country, especially if there is a talk of having, uh, you know, all these open jobs. Um, so that would be something as well. And so th you just need to make it part of sort of your, your computing in general. So there's a lot of computing programs here, IT and stuff like that. Every program needs to have cyber in it. So individuals are learning how to develop systems and maintain them, and they're thinking about security in the beginning, not in the after, right? They're not thinking of the afterthought. They're not thinking about, okay, we built the system, we got it deployed. Yeah, let's uh, let's let's configure our, our firewalls. Like, oh, let's, let's think about these policies beforehand so that we can test them appropriately. So one, the government needs a strategic plan on what they're gonna do. <clears throat> they need to make sure that that plan uh, is going to have the adequate people um, to help them move it forward and also make sure that they're developing people. Right? So when you, when you think about job growth and stuff like that, cyber is an area that you can have job growth. So now you have to think about a pipeline, how to pipeline individuals into this particular field um, to grow the economy and protect the economy. And then as you're doing things digitally, you need to think about, okay, well, if I'm going to have uh, individuals use credit cards, well, I need to make sure it's secure. I'll give an example, like um, going to the actual shopping areas here, the, the lovely malls, um, there are individuals, like if you purchase something with a credit card, they don't check to see if it's your signature, when they ask for your signature. Um, if you're using debit, they'll ask for a pen, but if you're using credit cards, a lot of times it won't ask for a pen. You'll just be able to put the credit card in there and you'll just be able to pay for your goods and that's it. There's no double checking. So individuals aren't trained to say, okay, well, let me see if this is actually fraud, right? So I'm going to, we'll say spa market. Is this actually fraud? Is this person's credit card? There's no check of those credentials. So there has to be, um, the actual human part of that equation has to be aware that these are things that they should be doing. Um, same thing with, you know, money laundering and stuff like that. It's like, okay, well, let me make sure that these are actually poolists. Are they, are these legitimate poolists? In a digital sense, this has to be done as well. And I think that is one of the things, this is one of many things that needs to be done. Um, but again, it's that whole trusting, um, that trust that's here in this particular country, which is good and which is bad because when you're actually hit with a real attack and people are really starting to take advantage of this particular nation, then it, it becomes an issue. Then you're scrambling to be reactive instead of being proactive. And I think right now you have the ability to be proactive. And that's where I think that Botswana needs to go to being proactive against these particular attacks that will come. They will come, especially if they're already coming at SA, they will come here. Thanks a lot, Prof. In terms of you, you talk about upskilling. I mean, Right now, if I'm going to admit a, 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 a second uh, a year one student into a cyber program, for, for example, it take take five year, four years, the minimum, for that set of students to graduate. So, but we are talking about the now, and the, the problems are existing now. We cannot wait, they're coming now. We cannot wait four years. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so what you do is you get creative, right? So it, it, it's like back in my country, people think you need a degree for everything. You need a degree to flip a burger. No, you don't. What you need, you need training for certain things. So some people will be degreed. Some people will go through a camp. Um, they'll go through maybe a year worth of training. They'll go through a couple months worth of training and they will get uh, qualified in, in a particular technology or skill set. And that's what could be done here. So if individuals are employed and maybe close to Maun or, or wherever in the country, where maybe it's mainly tourism, you can say, all right, well, we understand that it's mainly tourism here and we have enough people to help out with the sector. We need you to do, you know, do this particular task. We have a year train, year's worth of training for you. We train you on a particular technology. You get those individuals trained and you get them employed. That is something that you can do to augment our having degree programs. So you have to think about different ways to, you know, I guess, get your society um, moving up. 
you, you think about people coming from other countries, immigrating from other countries like Zimbabwe and stuff like that. So if somebody comes and they don't have maybe the adequate skills, you say, all right, well, we're going to put you in a training. And um, once you do this training, you owe our particular country or a particular company so many years, right? So many years back to pay for this training that we just gave you. You owe the, you know, you owe this trick, this money back or, or training, the, this, you owe a payback. And then they work for that, that company. And then after that, they, they do whatever they want. You have to get really creative in terms of what you're going to do to really, I guess, ignite the, um, the field here. Prof, I'll pass on to any of my colleagues if they have any questions or comments. I have a comment to this slide. Yeah. But, uh, uh, the, there were some, uh, this, this, uh, others are asking if they can ask questions from other platforms like the Facebook platforms because they, they here we can't, uh, they can't access the, the platform that we're using right now. So they wanted to know if they can just post their questions there. And then you can read for for prof on on HBF. Yeah, I think that will work. Yeah, we have uh, we have people who are monitoring the, the 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 Facebook and the YouTube. So if there are any questions, people can put them up on Facebook or YouTube, and they will be passed on through the chat to this uh, conversation. Uh, I think, Chair, with that, we can let Mr. Mughalimang prepare for 11 o'clock. Mr. Mughalimang, you are now the presenter. You can go ahead and set up as we continue to discuss. I'm not stopping the discussion. I'm just saying Mr. Mughalimang can go ahead and prepare for him to start exactly at 11 or at 12 o'clock. Sorry. As we wait for questions and comments from Facebook and colleagues here. Uh, Dr. Tabona, please go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Maupon, there's a question by uh, Richard Harriman. He says, what do you recommend should be done to educate consumers on how to protect themselves? Well, on so Facebook. This, oh, okay. <laughs> so it, it, this, this is an interesting item. I have a colleague, um, his name is Dr. Kevin Nobles, and he focuses on human factors uh, and your security. And so what that means is that save is online activity. It will depend on how you use that online uh, online platform. Do you use it for purchasing items? Um, what are things you're falling victim to? But in the interim, at least basic stuff like um, posting information regarding maybe your location, right? Do you need to share your location? Do you need to have images that you share that have metadata still in it that has your GPS tag where people can actually use that to create an analysis um, that looks at where you are and, and things of that nature. You may not share your address, but you just shared this lovely picture, um, and this picture has all your metadata in it. Uh, sharing account information, do you share this online? And also, um, I've noticed like uh, platforms like Facebook, people have like you know 3,000 friends. <laughs> There's only 2.5 million people in this country. Do you really know 3,000 people, and are you really all friends with them? Because individual and people, uh, based upon, oh, well, I see that I have 100 people that knows this person. I must I must know them. And so what that does is it creates an issue because now you have all these added people where they could be fake or Ill illegitimate accounts. And now they have insight into stuff about you. Because, you know, and then if you're playing these games that say, hey, you know, uh, share your birthday month and we'll tell you what type of person you are. You're actually sharing information about you, key information. Uh, also, if you're, um, you know, downloading various apps or using certain uh, websites that don't have like HTTPS, okay, it's not encrypted. Maybe you shouldn't use it. Or if you're um, um, doing um, work using a particular uh, computer or you're actually a computer that's, that anyone can use, okay, well, it, are my credentials stored in this machine? Or even do they have a key log on this machine? So it's, it really depends upon how the user is using um, ele their electronic equipment. And the, but also individuals just need to be aware in general on proper 
uh, etiquette for email, computer usage and stuff like that, you know, clearing cookies. Um, if they're on your home computer, making sure that um, whatever their home network is set up on that their particular router uh, has the password change and they're adding encryption and stuff like that. <clears throat> Prof, there is a, a question on the chat. <clears throat> yeah, so Angela, I, I see your I see your item. Um, you asked, um, has there what are they some significant cha uh, changes to policy and adoption of best practices towards curbing fake news, and especially for countries with advanced attacks such as deep fakes? <clears throat> countries, there's a particular nation that is um, that was a former uh, part of the uh, Soviet Union. What they do every Friday. They actually have a show that comes on TV, national TV, and they talk about all the particular claims that have come out and they dispute them uh, so they can shoot them down immediately. In my country, we haven't done anything like that. But in this particular country, they actually do that. So now you say, oh, well, I, I read that on Facebook just the other day. But, oh, this particular show saying um, this has been disputed. Um, we have found out it's legitimate. And now the particular person who watches it is like, oh, OK, well, this is illegitimate. I don't have to worry about this. So you need to attack these fake news head on because in this, in this country and in particular this continent, there is uh, a number of other countries from outside the continent that have a growing interest now, right? There's a growing interest in the African continent. So with that, a lot of particular countries are going to be buying for areas. You can call it recolonization or whatever, um, but that's what's occurring here. So as that occurs, or an attempt for it to occur, um, you know, the country needs to find a way to say, all right, well, um, this is what we've noticed and we are going to talk about this. So there needs to be an organization here that deals with educating individuals about fake news, something that uh, validates if it's real news. What I, what I enjoyed about <clears throat> Twitter in the last month of the uh, last month of the election is whenever Trump would post something, it would state um, this is actually this is false, and it would show the actual legitimate uh, item that is attached to it. Um, uh, COVID numbers are going down. Uh, technically, no, in certain areas is actually going up. Um, um, it talked about you know the COVID vaccine. So these are all really good because these are checks. Because even though that the actual news is out there, the real news is out there. Individuals are not going to not going to do that. They're going to be, I guess you could say, lazy. <laughs> They're not going to be maybe as motivated or they may be doing a ton of other things. So not everyone or they may not even have the know how to figure out what is actually real. And then with deep fakes coming around, um, it's going to be ever more important that there is an organization that is there to keep these items in check. Okay. Prof, one last question before Mr. Mugadiman starts from Facebook. Uh, the question reads, as a de as developing nation, should we trust the developed nations with our data? Ah, okay, that's a good one. I would say that the best decisions are always going to be in the ones that um, the, the, the people that own the data should be the ones that actually take care of the data. Um, when you think about information for a nation, I... If it was me in charge, right? If I was a Matswana for a day, I wouldn't trust anybody outside the government and someone that has actually been cleared to make sure that they're, they haven't been influenced, right? In the United States, you have to get a security clearance to access certain types of data. You have to get a security clearance. And that means not all Americans will get a security clearance. And then based upon the level of security clearance, even less will have access to it, which means that that data is trusted by a few. And so... As a Matswana, you have to think about what are the ways to ensure that your country's data is secure. And first of all, that means that I would not be entrusting another country with certain types of data at all. If it deals with the actual government, the federal government, I would not trust another country to maintain or even look at that data. No, no one else except for a Matswana should have access to that data if it deals with the actual government or things that pertain to critical infrastructure. It's just that simple. Uh, one last question, Prof. This is the very last question. Prof, uh, since you are in the COVID era, how 100% uh, are we sure that our data that you are providing as uh, uh, contact tracing information, how 
how can we be sure that this data is going to be used for uh, the right purposes? Uh, looking at the, we once experienced a situation where one shop was using our data for promotional purposes. So how are we sure that uh, the government is going to use our data for correct purposes? So that is more of a legal question, but what needs to occur, when you think about like privacy and stuff like that, uh, privacy engineering, what needs to happen is that there needs to be laws in place that actually penalize individuals that misuse the data. So if there's a government official that uses the data for something that is not intended for, they should be penalized and heavily penalized and made an example so that someone else can think of doing something that's stupid. But if you don't have that, then you're just hoping that things, um, you know, are not, you're just trusting, right? And that's what I was saying that is one of the main issues in this country, things are trustworthy. But yeah, there needs to be laws in place to penalize wrong actions, strong laws and laws to protect actual the citizens here in this country, uh, data privacy laws, strong data privacy laws. Thanks a lot, Prof. I think that's it, colleagues, in terms of questions. Uh, the MC, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof, once more. Uh, we are going to uh, continue with our talk, and I will invite uh, Mr. Deborah Mughali Mang, a CEO of Spectrum Analysis, to give us a talk about uh, digital transformation, digital risk, and business continuity. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Mahalema. Thank you, sir, for, for the warm welcome. Yeah, so let me first start by thanking the BUST team and uh, saying, with all protocols observed, this has so far been a great event. It's really been insightful from the way to go. And I'm really happy to follow on Professor Dawson's uh, talking points. And now I'd like to make this a more kind of fluid conversation that also connects different ideas we have had since the beginning of the event itself in the morning. Because it's really important for us to create dialogue and not just perhaps share technical stuff alone. And with that dissonance in mind, <laughs> I've, I've looked at, maybe it was a, a, in, in four, I initially wanted to give a technical presentation, but given the that I've had so far, I'm confident that the choice that I've made would really help all of us. But maybe to give you a bit of background on my, uh, especially my relationship with the Botswana International University of Technology is that I'm part of the Department Stakeholder Advisory Committee uh, for the Computer Science and Information Systems Department. Uh, we advise the department on creating links with the industry and ensuring that they produce students with the right skills fit into the industry. And the industry also shares that demands with the uh, department as well. So we, we really help with curriculum that has uh, impact in communities and can build funded students. I'm also in the advisory board for the Center of Management, Entrepreneurship and General Education at BUST. That's quite long. <laughs> it's a mouthful, but I we, we advise the university on how it can position itself to produce uh, innovations that can even end the university some uh, an enterprising university and also to build the character of like uh, graduates that the country needs in the increasingly complex world of ours where the nature of jobs are, have changed and we, nowadays it's all about skills and the ability to solve problems so for those who can become entrepreneurs, they can then uh, repurpose those there. But for those who end up being in the workplace, they need to be there because they didn't value from solving problems. But I'm also a community building because uh, 
since my graduation from the University of Southampton in UK, really, uh, I've, I've seen the, the, the levels in terms of the differences between the developing world and the developed world. And I've found that it's not necessarily because of resources per se, but the utilization of one's own strengths and also the ability to learn continuously as well. So I've also been really curious to understand what's unique in our ecosystem that allows us maybe to sustain some, what we can call inefficiencies for so long. And I found that we, we really have what I, I would say can be seen as a learning disability in that we don't improve over time. We have stagnated. So with that in mind, I work with a global community, which is really uh, assisting a group of systems anchor practitioners, where we look at ecosystems and consider complexity to see how you can shape them and not necessarily change them. But I work with uh, developers as well, so that because now we have seen uh, explosion of uh, young people like the young people now who are really trying on these new technologies to solve problems using technology. And um, we have decided to register a trust that would then look at the interest of the developers and also facilitate for support from them because uh, even though these are uh, uh, volunteer based they, we have seen them have great impact in uh, universities. We have seen them influence university curriculum. We have PyData BW. We have uh, Facebook developer circles. We have Google developer groups. And these all show just how, you know, if we can provide access to anyone really in the, to the internet, they can get access to material that could also help them improve their own skills hence driving us towards the knowledge-based uh, economy that we so desperately craves. Okay. I know we have started as a joke, who led digital transformation of your company? And uh, it's, it's really interesting so even despite the catastrophic loss of lives and the economic implications, and in a way, COVID-19 has really shined like a, took a magnifying glass and then so many structural limitations that were there in like our system locally and globally as well. So most because of limitations in terms of movements, uh, people having to work for We've really seen companies transforming first from within to improve their processes during the crisis by leveraging technology, automating the placement of orders, trading online. But we've also seen also the users themselves also working out to adopt uh, technology to access services as well. So the virus itself, though, the uh, calling us to respond proactively. It has also allowed us to learn lessons that I believe would have taken us 10 years to pick because in a short period of time, all our limitations, all our weaknesses came straight at us. And Professor Dawson really just uh, shared how just from the crisis in us going digital, we are also increasing the footprint uh, of uh, exposure for those with uh, area motives and who want to benefit from the same transformation as well, because it's not just organizations that want to transform. It's not just governments who want to deliver public services efficiently to Botswana. It's not just businesses in the different value chains who have uh, the need who to leverage the transformation Others as well can benefit, but they're on the dark side as well. So uh, usually when we speak about the disruptions that follow technology, we, we always come up with uh, examples that are from outside. 
So I thought maybe today I'll just show you, uh, share with you a, a use case or an example of a company that is now closing shop in Bot Botswana in South Africa, Musica. This used to be one of the coolest uh, places you could go, put on a CD, listen to like the latest uh, albums and all that on your headphones. And the, the, the writing really has been on the wall when you look at the dates there, because, you know, in 2013, they were really bullish that despite iTunes arrival, and that was before the other streaming uh, platforms, music streaming platforms came in. These guys were really confident that, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll stand the test of time. But fast track to about eight years, yeah, eight years, and they have closed shop. And it's precisely because we are now going through a period in which technology is forcing companies to, re to respond and change from within. And this is mostly driven by our hyper-connected world of digital devices from having human-to-human -human interactions on social media, uh, that allow us to exchange information, to share, um, to send each other money through digital platforms. Also from that, you have interactions like human process machines or a hybrid of any of them. You can have human to processes, human to machines, and all that. But all these interactions from human processes, machines, applications they use, systems, Nowadays, from these interactions, there is an exchange of economic value. And the value from this really is changing how economies used to be looked at. And now, in the emergence of this high value uh, digital economy, that is the trillions of dollars. And all this really is driven by the, what we may not realize as like the value drivers from the network effects of having people or, or devices or, people or systems and applications interconnected. Now, it's, it's also important perhaps to put something into context that is also like a huge driver of what is going on. Like when you go into the last industrial three industrial revolutions, uh, you know, the first, the second, and the third industrial revolutions were disruptive as well. But that disruption was kind of linear in terms of uh, you'd know, you could see that maybe if you increased uh, your efforts by this much, then this could be the benefit of uh, get and over time you can see that the the rate of innovation has been going like increasing but because of uh technologies that are behind the fourth industrial revolution we seen for the first time like a flip in the script before it, it used to be the case that you know they what we needed to do was a the technology that could allow us to achieve such outcomes but now no, the script has been flipped. Uh, it is us and our of technology and our understanding of the true potential of this technology, the risks, the potential to solve problems that is lagging behind now. The technologies are there and it all started with interconnectivity. The internet has provided like a global interconnective gateway. Uh, social media has just like our ability to quickly share information, whether accurate or not, as uh, Dr. Dawson also shared, uh, that is a risk that is a country. But the one device that is really on disruption on a different scale has to be the, the mobile technology. The ability to use our phones to do almost anything now really means we have one device that is connected businesses, processes, banks, payment platforms, social media, all in our hands. And now with the amount of data that we are generating at that scale, you can imagine 
many pictures we upload daily, how many videos we upload on your YouTube. And really, the amount of transactions that we have, that is being consumed, the amounts of searches, and the amount of currency that is being uh, generated. You can see that we we have now having a huge explosion of data. So our old ways of uh, maybe storing this data, processing it, are being challenged. And we have developed technologies that now us to that and we have cloud uh, technologies to allow us to scale and store data in the cloud uh, at minimum costs compared to to the past but now with the data there we need insight and with insights from such um, huge amounts of data settings we needed to adopt like our approaches to analyzing these data insights to drive business value the confluence of all these technologies and artificial intelligence are what is really fueling the industrial revolution because it's bringing change at exponential speed. I know we, as human beings, it, it's really, uh, difficult to visualize exponential growth, but look at that curve there and you just see how much of a step in time especially on the red side of the graph, leads to like a rise on the vertical axis. That's what exponential growth is. And it's been driven by slides are lagging. These technologies from the internet of things that allow us to have sensors on my uh, equipment, collect data, visualize like what is going on at process level from cloud computing, ability to not just store the process and then even build applications on top of innovation platforms, system integrations. If we are to connect everyone, so means we have different systems to connect, especially for e-government services. And I know that's one of the things that smart bots is uh, passing on as well. But then we, we can then forget that all these different connections pose increasing risks. So cybersecurity really is one of the approaches, you can even sometimes use it as a technology or as a practice, that we, we need to have capacity in if we are to secure Botswana's cyberspace role as we say we want through this symposium. Now, for businesses in the last three of, to five years, we, we have observed a change uh, in our ecosystem. You know, traditionally, uh, organizations just used to technology for the sake of having technology and it was one of the early questions that we we we, we asked as an image company on how come tech uh, organization your technology expensively so but it's failing to add how come we have this phrase system down on a regular basis yet when you looked at the cost of this technology they were in the millions. And it's precisely because we were building systems, but uh, forgetting that it's about operations. It's about processes of creating value. And in that, if you are to create value as organizations, you cannot discount the contributions of people. You cannot dis uh, discount the need to have a strategy of where you want to go. So now we are seeing companies rethinking their business models to become digital. And they, what they're pursuing, besides just the value, is all to be competitive. And competitive, sometimes there are us in the developing world may be, uh, may be slightly uh, misleading in that in many ways, everything is emergent here when it comes to technology. So the, the need for 
or for collaborations is is required more than perhaps just pure competition because that is what is also allowing uh, the data giants to prosper. It's because they're building platforms that allow others to connect on top of them so that you can, as an organization on top of platforms, optimize your workforce, optimize your operations, and offer your users a positive experience so that they come back and come your services. So you are adding value to your business by improving the quality of your interactions with everyone in your value chain. And this level of disruption really now has companies rethink these models. Musica didn't do that. And now they're closing shop. And there are so many examples that you can give with respect to this, but the aim really is to, 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 to label anyone bad, but to show how these technologies are really disruptive. Really disruptive. And the consumption of technology is also tied to trust. And I guess if you consider what uh, Dr. Dawson, uh, Dr. Dawson was sharing, you must then have uh, some cognitive dissonance in trust. Here in one way for us to collaborate and for us to consume these services, we need people to have confidence that they're secure. But at the same time, the people's levels of trust as well is also a liability when it can be exploited by those who have ill intentions to uh, compromise uh, information to com and it can be to compromise information at operations level it can be to compromise the infrastructure that you have as a company it can be because somebody is bringing the now from the workforce perspective they're bringing the a mobile phone work, and now that mobile phone is becoming a doorway to a, what would have been a secure uh, network on its own. So there are many tasks that are coming because of uh, the increasing interactions, complexity, and with complexity, it also means the risks are being magnified, and most of them we're still blind to because we yet to really the full of extent of the impact of the technologies that we have. So in, in our experience, we in interacting with our communities, in interacting with the government of Botswana, the different departments and institutions in the ecosystem, especially our entrepreneurship, innovation and innovation. And in Facing with companies, uh, our clients as well, we have found that we have three main vices and uh, non technology because the technology is already there, it has the potential it has, but we don't seem to have the right mindset to extract the minimum value from the data. We don't seem to see what we can do together, and we don't seem to have shared values to build on top of so that we can prosper together. Here we are, we want uh, a digitally, a cyber secure Botswana, but we are not uh, also making uh, uh, a case for having digital prosperity for all. Can we have a company, uh, uh, a Botswana that is cyber secure when we still have other members of our community uh, being uh, uh, excluded in our economy that is created by our value to, in connecting to the global networks and the value chains that we have. We also have a cultural uh, limitation, the way we are doing things. And sometimes culture, when we hear these words, they, they tend to have more of a negative connotation and because it's difficult, you can't touch culture but you can look at what people are doing and say, yeah, these people are having these outcomes and these outcomes are connected to A, B, C, D that they do. And with organizations really, the challenge now given the volatility, given the, 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 the levels of risk, then the complexity and given the, the, the answer 
quality of uh, these uh, accelerated rates of change from technology, 19 and all that, means organizations need to transform from within. And to transform from within challenges culture. And we know that it's a strategy for breakfast. So looking at the softer side of things, to guarantee organizations um, a, a more kind of informed path, a whole uh, getting value from digital transformation itself. And leadership as well. Somebody then has to uh, govern organization on a shape Where do we want to? Uh, leadership doesn't necessarily become a political thing, but we can also need developing country like ours to have government transit, not in terms of leading where things should go, but in uh, aggregating all the ecosystem players and stakeholders to converge and have the same conversations on how we could get to what for. So, in many ways, even in our respective roles, we should be the ones leading if we are to be the problem solvers that all companies really need to hire going forward. So uh, I, I would like to put it to you. It's not a tested uh, theory. Uh, there is no research to back it up, really. But I believe if you could address the mindset challenges, culture and leadership challenges, we may get that 80 percent gain from just 20 percent of our efforts. All right, so where could we begin? One of the lessons that I found from looking around since the outbreak of COVID-19 was the explosion in homegrown solutions. Uh, we, we have great uh, facilities here in Botswana in terms of uh, at, at mandate level, our institutions uh, share like uh, what could be more of a responsibility towards uh, making sure that Botswana can prosper. But we, we have a challenge. We have a challenge in that we have good policies and always cite poor implementation. So in many ways, we, we need to change our old ways of, of doing things and securely innovate from the disruption. And innovation there doesn't just need to be from a technology point of view. Innovation can be in how we think about our challenges because the language and the mental models that we use to describe our problem all also limit the solutions of, that we have in front of us. So if we could look at the disruption and look at what is emerging from disruptions, we should realize that there are more uh, digital applications that are being built from the country, but are they secure? We have seen from some of the solutions put forth, forward in response to COVID-19, we've seen uh, cases, uh, there was even a case in court that one of them was compromised, but we didn't see any acknowledgement to close the gap. It's almost, went like uh, whenever we find something that is not going right, we tend to personalize and see that as uh, a reflection of our personal ability to deliver. And perhaps that's part of like what, from a mindset point of view, we need to address. We then also need to secure all interactions between humans to humans using technology, humans and machines, humans and processes, humans and services, humans and systems, humans and networks, networks and networks, uh, computers and computers, anywhere where there is an exchange of information that is enabling the digital economy, we need to have secure interactions there. And uh, because these are the devices that we use are networked, we need to have uh, network devices being secure as well. And by companies now gathering 
information to understand that clientele. Companies also need to realize that increases their responsibility towards the securing such information that they collect. It also means organizations now should invest even in educating those they collect from information they collect would be used for and for what purposes because there really is a huge gap we we in this state where people are just ready to click and install the next uh, cool thing and it was quite interesting to see <laughs> the attitudes and the discussions after uh, whatsapp changed its uh, privacy policy because most of the discussions were more around, uh, okay, now we're ditching WhatsApp and we're moving to the next platform. But you could see that, uh, you could feel that there wasn't an investment unpacked from an awareness building point of view by companies first. You know, by individuals asking the right questions as well. So each to an increase in response and responsibilities as well. They emerge from our ability to collect even more data as innovators, as government, as companies, organizations that deal with human beings as well. So I was also happy in the morning during the opening ceremony to hear that uh, we, we have a cyber agenda. And one of the goals that we set for this particular symposium which I've been happy to be a, a, an organizing member of uh, and a sponsor as well, has really been an inclusive cyber agenda. Because uh, it's my sincere belief that uh, most of the policies that we have could be improved by uh, having uh, proactive uh, engagements at grassroots level. We cannot build policies for people and not include them in the feedback process and even in the evaluation of the impact they're having in their lives as well. So I am um, in my uh, quick agenda, I'll have those five point, uh, it's my five point personal agenda, but it spills into something even larger now. If, if you were to look at the amount of the, the, the things that we need to break apart to create new things, we are in a better position than most country, developed countries, to be honest. And I believe that also poses a challenge on how we could then leverage what is there to leapfrog forward. Because what is happening is the rate at which evolution or, or, or other countries are going forward, the rate at which uh, those with ill intentions are becoming better at the, what they do, it's, it's faster than our rate of learning and our rate of catching up. So we cannot then assume a linear approach that would have worked maybe for the first, second and third industrial revolutions as like the one of the slides showed. But we need to think about taking leaps and I don't know of any better way to leap forward by leaping together. I believe if we could uh, align our efforts, coordinate our activities in the digital economy around cyberspace and cyber security, cyber crimes, and digital transformation, if we could align efforts there and, and build from synergies that we have as an ecosystem, we'll manage to leap frog no doubt and in it it's necessary for us really to be involved because you know the the the, 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 the there is some sexy language that is being used sometimes to to describe the, the the modern economy some would come out and say data is the new oil but then i i really love the 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 what is on the slide there that data is not the new gold data is the new oil but it's not oil necessarily for its economic effects it, it also has the damaging or polluting effects that we we need to take into consideration as we 
drive our organizations using data, as we improve government services using data to make evidence-based decisions, to understand policies in a continua and continuously monitor and evaluate them for improvements. And even us as individuals, we, we should know that the data that we share creates equal value for someone. I think it may be one of the things that I, I still find puzzling that you know it's it's not being thrown out for people to understand how uh, modern platform economies work and how they leverage the data that they create uh, the value for the for the shareholders, for the employees, and for the customers as well. So to a certain degree, we talk about personalization of application, but that personalization is surveillance. So if we can personalize surveil, we need to think about ethics, we need to think about corporate social responsibility around ensuring that we determine cyber environment in the country. Okay, so I've been saying we do this, we do that, but who are we? Um, as I shared earlier, um, our company, Spectrum Analytics, uh, is a sponsor here, and we, we've really been involved in the ecosystem. But what we want to do is really to create a smarter and sustainable world. And we, we believe we can do that by simplifying and accelerating value creation from the emerging technologies that we shared. And we, from the emerging technologies, what we do is we build secure applications, we optimize business processes, we manage data. We believe that, you know, and such as there are these, we exchanging buzzwords, and it sounds exciting to talk about your machine learning and uh, all the other cool analytical analytics tools and stuff from artificial intelligence, AR, and all that. As cool as those are, they are meaningless if the pipelines that the data is exchanged on is not secure. So you need to build robust uh, data pipelines if you are to become data driven as an organization. And to do that, you need to think about uh, components that you need to get right to be able to transform digitally, which includes strategy, which includes processes, which includes uh, capacitating your people, which includes choosing the best technology to support your business goals, because you, through all that, you can then have data that allows you to make the right decisions, but it only adds value if you are able to extract insights from that. And with that, you can then create value. And with value creation, it's a testimony of our pursuit for impact with those we work with, because we believe in the power of co-creation. So you can connect with us through uh, the handlers there. And I would also love to share with you, uh, just to buttress the point around us really being impact oriented or impact driven. Uh, as a response to COVID-19 and uh, a third call for proposals by Botswana Innovation Fund, Spectrum Analytics was funded to digi uh, build a solution that we called MABI. This is a people-first digital solution for digitizing the application processes for people to say they are vulnerable during the time of crisis, as we saw, or we still see. We also digitize the workflows. We're providing dashboards for decision makers. We're considering all the elements of digital transformation from giving the users a uh, positive experience from providing digital inclusion, because through the platform, you have people being able to self-register, 
using any technology of choice from USSD to WhatsApp to Facebook Messenger to web platform to mobile platforms. It's there on uh, Google Play and Apple Store as well. But I guess we, we really embody the impact part of what we do because we, we also now are uh, working on a project we call Hackathon for Blood that we saw that uh, for since last year, we know there have been calls that our blank blood banks are running dry. And to show how we truly collaborate, we, we want to, we have brought together a group of uh, stakeholders there who each have a role to play from understanding the problem from the human side of things to also building the tech and also testing uh, everyone else involved. But more related to today's event is the Fire for Vision 2036. I guess some of you may have already seen like the videos advertising this that have been played since morning. This is a project that came about two years back. And back then we were changing our landscape in the country. We saw that we had Vision 2036. And we also saw, saw that there is global disruption by technology. And in the conferences, the workshops that we attended, we saw that there wasn't any uh, merging of these so that we could uh, achieve digital prosperity for all and really leave no one behind as the country steps into the digital economy itself. So more details will be released on that. Uh, and uh, maybe before I wrap up, I would like to share some things that I, I, I hope uh, they will come out throughout the, the, the conference. Um, I'm expecting to hear what our thinking are around misinformation and disinformation because uh, with the ability to uh, share information readily, we are also opening up to risks of uh, spreading lies. Uh, we may, sometimes we, we, we come up with fancy terms to, to, to call them that, but really if it, it's, it's lying and it's spreading information that is, uh, curated to deceive. So we, with that in mind, we, we need to see how that is also tied to our national security, given how we have seen in uh, other countries, how information curation has been used to influence democracies. It has been used to incite violence and also how it can be used to distract people from looking at what should matter in the current uh, times of crisis as well. We also saw how misinformation could disrupt uh, efforts to contain COVID-19 when there was information about everything out there. And, I mean, you just needed to pick your side and you, you had your belief. We also need to rethink uh, data privacy because it's more than just secrecy. Uh, the, 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 the interactions, the different interactions that we have need to be secure and they need to uh, uh, guard and, and protect privacy through the data exchanges as well. So even the data that I may exchange maybe through the streaming platform, maybe I have a challenge with it being shared with someone else. So we then need to really bring to the fore uh, data flows and how these data flows as uh, drivers of economic value in the digital world should also be controlled without maybe stifling innovation per se. But it's, it's an area of concern, especially in, in a trusting country like ours, as uh, Professor Dawson said. And the other thing worth looking at for us is continuous learning. We need to learn from our mistakes. It's okay, nobody has all the answers and that should be one of the things COVID-19 should have taught us. 
nobody has all the answers. So we shouldn't really uh, try to get too far ahead of ourselves. We should look at where we, where we are, the capacities we have, the networks we have, and exploit them to continuously develop uh, the capacity to get Botswana to be cyber secure. We should also be mindful of globalization risks. You can, I mean, with WhatsApp, one of the questions that I had hoped people would have asked around the time they changed their data privacy would have been why in EU, the same changes were not going to apply. What is unique there? And why is it that there is this selective compliance to data protection regulations and privacy requirements? And what, does, what do the gaps that emerge from the different levels of compliance say? Are we saying to be selective to meet certain regulations is compliance while you are breaking them in other places? Are we saying those who are lagging behind in terms of their understanding should really be uh, dealt with at the level of their knowledge or ignorance? Because that's what this is also saying. We should also notice that globalization is not going to wait for us to catch up. So the, the, the need to build skills, local skills, to really address all the challenges that we need to overcome to become cyber secure in the country needs to be prioritized. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, feel free to uh, drop us emails on those uh, handlers. We, we're looking for people we could work with across all the different levels of engagement in our community. And as we'll see during the event, we'd really love to have everyone uh, as part of the Fire for Vision 2036 project here because it's going to also scale across Africa. For Africa, we are going to call it uh, for IR for impact. And we're already in talks with uh, some development partners to see how we could scale that. But it would really be nice to have this being a project that showcases uh, co-creation at ecosystem levels. And co-creation would mean having everyone involved in ensuring that we create uh, sustainable economies from the digital economy. And doing that requires us to also secure our cyberspace. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mohalema, for the presentation. presentation. <clears throat> I will hand back to uh, Dr. Maupo for further coordination, but uh, I'm also opening for any questions and uh, comment. If there are any, you can, you can ask. And I guess Mr. Mahaloman will be uh, available to answer the question or comment on. Yeah. Maybe while we are also still waiting for comments, uh, let me also share my gratitude uh, towards our partners who have also come to become part of the project and the initiative to raise awareness and educate our ecosystem on cyber re security related issues. Uh, a shout out to Meta Router and a shout out to Upcentrix. Uh, you know, it's there are uh, we we tend because they of the level of uh, skills capacity required. They no one can do it on their own. So they I just wanted to mention them to highlight the strength of partnerships, especially partners who can then come back and play a larger role in an event of this magnitude as well. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Ramakalemang. Uh, 
as we kindly await for any comments and questions. Uh, comments and questions, they can either be through Facebook or YouTube and or the chat here. Uh, Mr. Mohaliman, just for for appreciation, I know currently there is a huge drive because of all the initiative that uh, Dr. Tabona talked about in his opening, uh, opening uh, what was it, uh, overview of the event in the morning. There is a huge initiative by the government to go through a lot of development. There will be the electronic passport, there will be the electronic omang and stuff like that. And as someone who has developed in, a, when you give an example about Mabui, what can you say to developers out there about the process of secure development of your applications? Because like Prof. Morrison has outlined, we need to start now. And with all the developments that are coming, we need to develop securely. So, Ramo Halimang, if you could comment on the process of secure development that you went through, the experience you went through when you are developing Mabui securely. Oh, thank you. Uh, that is such a, 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 a great question indeed, because the, the thing that uh, startled me when we started the project was really regulation that you can feel. We, we have the Data Protection Act from 2018 that we made, we provided the motivation to comply with that, but it's not been enacted. You see that we interface with manual and paper-based processes where we still collect information that I, I doubt is still needed around marriage uh, uh, marriage status, who the headman of my home village is. We, we're still collecting such fields about people. And, you know, we have also seen how people are taking advantage of data when it's on paper, just to get other people's numbers, especially with uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, registrations. So, the, what we did, because we wanted to instill confidence and trust in people that the application that we are building is for the vulnerable and not exploit that vulnerability any further, we engaged Senuelo uh, Mugise to become our legal consult in, in, in that respect. She was part of like Mabui team, or she is still part of Mabui team, to be honest. And she advised us on issues around uh, building applications with security, being secure by default, and not thinking about security as an after fact. So we went through that uh, process. And you can imagine being uh, a, a company that had to deliver within 10 weeks. Most of what we did was to focus on the human side of the solution, which then allowed us to see the different levels of our risk, uh, where data was being exchanged, where we could have potential to have data misused, and then close such gaps in the form of, okay, what data should we connect? And the interesting thing then is, when you put your application on app stores, Google and Apple will give you a hard time. For example, we we collecting people's numbers because uh, we want to add a payment platform in the end to pay to sell. But then Google would say, you shouldn't collect somebody's number. Facebook gave us a hard time for that as well. And therein you see that you know, there is this differential compliance here in Botswana, you know, you can do whatever almost, but then when you try to now integrate to the rest of the world, you need to play uh, in the A-League. So I would say for, for, for us, 
having been prepared for 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 that eventuality and also assuming the the moral responsibility and the ethical responsibility to ensure we build a, a, a robust application that would give people confidence that indeed our locals can build solutions that can scale and go on to change lives that was also part of the motivation so the tools are there uh we we i i would really would love for us through collaborations with yourselves at Boost to work with your students and developer communities that you have supported in the past to really bring everyone up to speed with what to look at and the risks for building unsecure applications. Thank you, Dr. Mabo. Thanks a lot, Ramo Haliman. There is a couple of questions on the chat. Please go ahead. Which one? Uh, based on your views on cyber inclusivity, taking you back to the formative years of DIS, where a lot of Batuan were pessimistic on the intentions of the organizations, how should we balance security and privacy on the internet? Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's a that's an interesting question because it's in many ways even what we do as companies like i had mentioned is surveillance at what level should we allow surveillance at the benefit of getting uh services that are personalized for us if i'm applying for an insurance and i've been sharing my exercising data with the applications that they have and they give me a discounted uh, coverage rate. Should I say no because they built that using collecting more data and understanding more of what I do? But at the same time, there is this moral dilemma around the ownership of people's personal experiences because that's what part of the surveillance brings, the ability to predict behavior, the ability to evoke uh, the needed emotions to support a particular cause. So in many ways, balancing security and privacy, you know, it's no longer just enough to say that we can anonymize the data and the, uh, from anonymizing the data, you can't identify individuals. No. Now by, uh, by taking the different data that is shared about people, the, you can then correlate these to publicly available data sets in some instances, and then you start realizing that uh, anonymization is not like the best layer of, of eliminating the challenge. But security is tricky as well, because uh, to, to a degree, we cannot compromise on infrastructure security. We cannot compromise on issues that involve tech because technology now understands us more than we understand ourselves. It, it, it's, it's, it, it's something that has really been interesting to see evolve because we have people who understand human psychology also uh, helping build models that uh, take advantage of the data that we share. So the balance there really should be around uh, responsibility. Is it responsible to collect this and what purpose? So I believe uh, as a country really, uh, these are those uh, touch points are, are worth bringing to the fore. We, we don't need to start from a position of really knowing. We can start from a position of sharing the same concerns. And if we, if we have the right uh, commitment and we we, we 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 are authentic in our intentions, I believe we will always find ways to close gaps because the, the, the landscape is forever evolving. So we may find a response for what's the case now, and in a few years' time, the, that won't necessarily be relevant because the landscape has evolved. Uh -huh. There's another question. Mohaleman. Okay. Yes, there's another question from Mapanyani. Please go ahead. Okay. 
As a country, we are busy putting efforts into advancing technology for provision of services, yet a large section of the population hardly understands issues around cybersecurity, beneficial use, and play. What can be done to bring citizens to the right understanding of the benefits of technology application to improve livelihoods and business functionality, even at the lowest level? So uh, that's a great question, uh, and that that level, that kind of thinking really is what led to the formation of Fire for Vision 2036, that and Fire for Impact as well, because we realize that we cannot say what we are doing adds value when it's not uh, improving people's lives, especially at grassroots level. And we need to be cognizant of the fact that Botswana is one of the most unequal countries in the world, despite our small population. So it means as our economy was growing, the GDP measure of economic growth was going up, the people's fortunes were being reversed. And it's a challenge that we need to address because part of it comes from not really focusing on how we could creatively leverage these common connections to create shared value and shared economies. There is a huge potential for us to use these technologies for inclusion as well. So I think there is a project like that. Uh, I'll, I'll share more information with you in the interest of time. Uh, we've created a vehicle that we would love to see industry in. demystifying the technologies, showing how they are applied at grassroots level or wanting to apply them or link us to anyone who surely love to work with such people. And as for the challenges that come from digitization here in Botswana, it's actually quite interesting because uh, most CTOs and most uh, transformation managers from conversations that we have had, you realize that they talk the talk. But what we have found is most organizations struggle with identifying where to start. And it's because they're not looking at this from a holistic point of view, that they're looking at siloed improvements. That's, that cannot lead to transformation. If you are not going to allow your organization to be vulnerable enough to transform from within, to see how data flows, to see how you could secure that, to democratize data, and also now to come to encapsulate all that and translate that into business value. That requires a data strategy in the modern world. And most organizations don't start there. Most organizations want to start with quick wins. And within a short period of time, there is a confession that, you know, what we are seeing is that this is not a dim value. No, it's the approach that was not a dim value. Uh, Ramohalemang, in the interest of time, you have a couple of questions. Uh, one so, was as, as a company... We... Are you there? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, the, the other question, the other comment was that, what are you talking about here? Is it collaboration as a service? And based on that, uh, if you when you address that, uh, could you also touch on the fact that as if it's a collaboration as a service, how can Spectrum anal uh, Spectrum Analytics assist a corporate company in a way to? You you are fading out. Uh, did you? Okay, I was saying there is a comment that what you are talking about is it corporate collaboration as a service. So, and if that is the case, could you also highlight how Spectrum Analytics could assist a corporate through the journey of digital transformation in a secure manner? Oh, yes, uh, that, that's, a, that's a great uh, question. Uh, for us, what we do uh, through the network of our partners, we, for example, having realized that data management is one of like the critical parts of like starting on the journey it really lays the platform because you need to secure your data assets because you may find yourself in a situation where you are 
compromised and the details of those you want to serve are being uh, accessed illegally. So data management, even if you want to later on add analytics uh, down the pipeline, you then need to unify uh, all the data across your applications and unify them into, uh, it can be your data warehouses, or if you have streaming data, it can be your data lake. It's run analytics on top. So we help organizations with setting the pipelines, uh, coming up with uh, uh, digital transformation roadmaps, and also helping them to build uh, applications, as well as uh, providing secure uh, data management uh, tools and on the cloud especially and also helping with uh, checking their current capabilities and, and being proactive all the time by leveraging your machine learning to continuously sniff for attacks to look for outliers that could uh, become uh, indicated that you want is being compromised we have partners like upcentrics as well so we I'm happy to say, yes, we, 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 we provide capability and to, to help organizations to become data driven. And we, we have the partners and capabilities to deliver to that extent as well. And it, it, we tend to work more as an innovation studio because we'll, we love to take a problem understand the problem deeply using your design thinking approaches. And from then on, really, once we understand what has to be achieved, the business outcomes and all that, that's when we touch technology as the last thing. So for us, really, technology, you know, that is, is, is just a tool. And the project for IR for Vision 2036 is, is also part of like our giving back from what we have understood to come back and, and help uh, organizations get their thinking right and also to promote uh, best practices amongst their employees, their customers and government and across industries as well. So uh, that's how we uh, assist corporates as well. Mm. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Ramakhalimang. I think all of us are very hungry here and we have a very tight lunch. Uh, just one last question. Uh, this one asks you to predict the future. So uh, you did talk about the exponential growth of for IR. Uh, the question is, do you foresee it uh, falling rapidly at one point in the future? I think if you could predict the future, maybe one day you'll be famous. So the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, let me take your news and avoid hanging myself. Uh, it's a, it's a multi-layered approach I'll give you because we have different industries at different levels of uh, readiness and uh, development in our data-driven journey. You still have really basic, basic uh, challenges around digitization where these the manual and paper-based processes if we see more of those rise if we see more of grassroots uh solutions i expect the, the 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 exponential growth to be maintained for some time because that would mean take africa for example that would mean you are onboarding uh, a lot of people and their individual connections as well. So I expect that to even uh, the, the the rate to, to go up as well. So if you are also going to look at uh, organizations that still rely on traditional business models, uh, anyone who's not going to play uh, fair to share the APIs for others to innovate on top of, uh, disrupted because now we the, the economies are moving towards shared value economies where it's not just we don't just want to, to be users because if our data creates value we can also we should also be thinking about benefiting from our data and i think i saw last week uh, it's been there for like a month in australia uh facebook uh, is 
there is a regulation that has been passed that forcing Facebook to to share to pay news uh, outlets for that content. So I'm um, I'm I'm expecting to see those who are not going to be agile going out of the way like Musica. I'm also expecting our government really to, to, to go through a period of great uncertainty as well because there's a lot that we need to do. And when there's a lot to do, sometimes we miss the, 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 the trees, the forest for the trees. So I, I believe for us to get forward in that respect, the number of uh, potential interventions at public services there are a lot of them, so I expect the CAF to remain as well. It's it's differential, but uh, I, all in all, I, I expect the CAF to remain uh, as it is for some time because this is the first revolution in which Africa is proactively shaping its future. Unlike the past revolutions, I mean, the last one, the third one, we were still grappling with independence. There was no Botswana in the second and the first one, it's only now that the country has people thinking what everyone else is thinking in the world. So I'm expecting the CAF to remain growing. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ramokhalema. I think that brings us uh, to the end of this session. Uh, we'll uh, resume the afternoon session at 2 p.m. Uh, if you could kindly log in again around 15 minutes before 2 for the panel discussions in the afternoon session, there will be four panel, two panel discussions. The first one on the on cybersecurity and the second one on cybersecurity and 4IR. Uh, I have sent, we are going to use the same credentials as the ones we used for this morning. So feel free to sign in uh, 15 minutes before uh, 2 o'clock. Thanks a lot, ladies and gentlemen. Enjoy your lunch. Where, where are we being served? Uh, this is virtual. You can go on YouTube, look for, <laughs> for a video of food and then enjoy. I'll try that.